Good morning. This uh, committee hearing will come to order. Uh, I want to welcome uh, the Director of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, Dr. Keith Hall, here today, and you know certainly thank you for your your, your time and, and your appearance and, and your thoughtful testimony. Um, the issues we're, we're going to deal with in this hearing are, are difficult. I was just speaking to the director ahead of time. How, how do you convey to the American public the depth of the problem so that we collectively can take the first step in solving any problem, which is admitting we've got it? And that's, you know, I've done a lot of problem solving in my manufacturing background. You have to first lay out the reality, understand you know, the definition of the problem, uh, describe it properly, but you really have to make, take that first step, and we, we really got a problem if you have any hope of, of solving them. Uh, th this committee has a mission statement, and I, I don't think we can repeat it enough. It's to enhance the economic and national security of America. Um, and I think this hearing is going to address both of those components, because I, I believe, and I agree with the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, when he said the greatest threat to our national security is literally our debt and deficit, and we're going to be talking about our deficit. Now, I would define the problem we're facing with uh, in terms of our debt and deficit not as a 10-year budget window problem, which is you know, so, so much of what we're always grappling here with our budgets, it's a 10-year budget window. What we really have is we have a 30-year demographic problem here. We have all the baby boom generation, people like uh, Senator Carper and myself, we got white hair. Um, yours isn't quite as white as mine. It's getting close. It's getting close. Uh, that's okay. At least we still have hair. There you go. Huh? We're, we're, we're retiring to rate of 10,000 people per day. We've made all these promises to the baby boom generation. We really don't have a way to pay for them. And we, we've got we've to you know, step up the plate and admit that. Um, part of the problem is we're not admitting it as political leadership. And I, I've got to repeat this story because it's, it's pretty relevant. I was in the White House. We, we, you know, to President Obama's credit, he did go out to dinner with a number of us. And, and uh, partly, maybe largely because of my prodding, I asked the President, well, if you're serious about making a dent in our debt and deficit, make your White House staff available to us. Let's, let's start working. Let's try and find those areas of agreement, which is what we're trying to do in this committee. So don't worry about things that divide us. Concentrate on the areas of agreement. I know Senator Enzi is a, a, a pro at that in terms of legislation. What can we agree on? And so I, I, I brought my accounting skills. I brought that problem definition skill. So we were in the White House for a two-hour meeting. And President Obama came in for the last half, and, you know, of course, he wanted everything on the table. And I said, you know, fair enough, Mr. President, if you want everything on the table, here's how you do it. And I, I, I slid in front of him a, a chart that looks something similar to this. You know, 30 years, by decade, here's, here's the size of the deficit. You know, use your bully pulpit. Take the truth to the American public. Make sure the American people understand the depth of the problem so that collectively we can take that first step in solving any problem, which is admitting we have one. You know what he said to me? He said, Ron, we can't show the American public numbers that big. If we do, they'll get scared. They give up hope and says, besides, Ron, we can't do all the work. We have to leave some work for future presidents, future Congresses. That's not leadership. That's an abdication of leadership. So again, the purpose of this hearing is show the American people the truth. And uh, what we need to do, as much as I appreciate all the work CBO has done, their long-term projections, and again, let's stipulate, these are projections. It's, it's hard to fully understand and predict out in the future. But we can take a look at projections, we can compare those to previous history. And as much as I understand the, the relevance and the necessity of looking at these things as a percentage of GDP, the problem is most people don't deal in percentages. We, we deal with dollars. You know, that's how we pay for things. So dollars are more relevant. And so I, I want to continue to work with uh, uh, Director Hall and CBO and, and the economists there of trying to figure out a way to present the reality, the depth of the problem, the American people, so they understand it. And uh, I've got a lot of I've got a lot of charts and graphs that we developed a, a one year a one page income statement, which is out on the chart right now that, that pretty well lays it out. I mean that's the, by the way that's the purpose of any income statement: describe reality, but describe reality for the purpose of directing action. This one year this one page income statement does that. In, in one page, it shows pretty much the, the financial situation of America on, a, on an income basis, and it shows that Social Security will pay out about, four, 14, points, about $14 trillion more in benefits than it takes in the payroll tax over the next 30 years. Medicare pays out about $34 trillion more. And then the rest of the $103 trillion deficit over 30 years, which we're going to be talking about today, is interest on the debt. Three elements. Three elements. 
Social Security deficit, Medicare deficit, and interest on the debt drive that $103 trillion unsustainable deficit. We need to understand that. But let me, let me just throw out one more little factoid here that I think hopefully will grab the attention of the audience, of, of the members of the committee, and, and hopefully the American public. We're all witnessing pretty much the collapse of, of Greece's welfare system, how unsustainable that model is. And again, we, again we, we hear this all the time. I've been in here now four, four and a half years, and I've heard witness after witnesses talk about how our current fiscal situation in America is unsustainable. Well, let's just do a comparison. And we, we calcul this, calculated this number as of the end of the first quarter, so they're comparable between Greece and America. Today, or at the end of March, in America, every American share of our current federal debt as of March 31st, 2015, every American share, my share, my kid's share, my grandchild's share, share is $56,710. By comparison, the share of every Greek's share of their debt in Greece is $30,786. So Americans on an individual basis, our share of our federal debt is almost double what Greek share is of their federal debt. Now, why don't we have the riots in the streets? You know, why don't we have a financial crisis today like Greece has? Well, because we're the world's reserve currency. And we can, in fact, print money to fund this, this debt. Greece's creditors have run out of patience. At some point in time, America's creditors are going to run out of patience. They're going to look at America and say, you know, you're not very serious in coming to terms with the debt and deficit. We're not going to loan you any more money, or we're certainly not going to loan it at that interest rate. And at that point, interest rates spike for every 1% increase in interest rates. That's $180 billion more that's added to our interest payments. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we've got to try and convey. That's what we have to admit. So again, I ask unanimous consent to enter my written statement into the record, my opening statement. With that, I'll turn it over to Senator Carper for his comments. Thanks. Again, th thank you for, for appearing, and, and thank you and, and your staff at CBO for all your hard work. Um, I think the question is, how do we grab the American people's attention with numbers, you know, with financial data? You know, I'm an accountant. You're an economist. Uh, I like numbers. You like percentages. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. It's something I've been grappling with for literally four and a half years. Uh, one, one of my attempts in this was really with a couple amendments that uh, I offered that were adopted unanimously in our, our budget process this year. Uh, one was uh, the guts of it says the Congressional Budget Office shall provide a projection of federal revenues, outlays, and deficits for the 30 year period begin beginning with the budget year expressed in terms of dollars. Um, this is kind of what I had in mind. And I would really, and I want to keep working with you, I, I would really prefer this was a Congressional Budget Office chart so that we didn't have to take uh, the detailed information and try and grapple with it and come up with our interpretation so it was incredibly authoritative. Because this is extremely important that we have a nonpartisan uh, organization, agency like yourselves, that definitively say this is what this projection results in in dollar terms. Because again, people don't pay for their electricity bill and food in percentages, they use dollars. So, so Americans understand dollars. So let, let's start here. Uh, and this is your alternate fiscal scenario. And done by decade, I think this lays it out pretty simply. And that's, you know, coming from business, I, I like the KISS principle, keep it simple. Uh, first decade, about $10 trillion of projected deficit according to your alternate fiscal scenario. The second decade, $28 trillion. The third decade, $60, $66 trillion for a whopping total over the next 30 years projected deficit by your alternate fiscal scenario of $103 trillion. Now, again, we're becoming immune to these massive numbers. Who can really understand them? So I've added to this chart uh, the dollar value of all private assets. The net asset base of America is $116 trillion. That's what we're looking at over the next 30 years. Let's, now, I, I want to talk, let's take that one down and put, put the next chart, because this is where I'll convert to, to percentages on a relative basis. And it's really going to be the base of my first question. Uh, you, the numbers you were talking about in your testimony was really based off your baseline, correct? Your baseline projection. I'm, pro I'm showing the alternate fiscal scenario. 
for me to take a look at projections, this is what I did in business, you know, I do my budgeting process, I would always take a look at history. You know, what, what, what is, you know, are these numbers relevant? Do they compare to, to history? So what I've done, again, try and keep it as simple as possible. I've laid out percentage of GDP for these spending categories the th prior 30 years, from 1985 to, to 2014. Then I've got CBO's baseline projection, and the third column is CBO's alternate fiscal scenario. So let's just, again, trying to keep it simple, entitlements, total entitlements, Social Security and health care, last 30 years about 7.7 percent of GDP, and under both scenarios, you, that's expected to rise to 13.1 percent. Now, that's, I mean, health care is that more difficult one to, to really project. Social Security is pretty darn close, right? I mean, we know because of demographics, uh, actuarial math, that type of thing, We've got a pretty good handle on Social Security over the next 30 years, coming in with about a $14 trillion deficit in terms of what we pay out in benefits versus the payroll tax. Is that correct? That's right. Healthcare definitely has more on Social Security. But again, so, so but, but this does show the dramatic increase, 7.7% 7, 7 .7 to 13.1%. Now, on defense, the last 30 years, on average, we spent about 4.2%, and this includes the 90s, where we really went pretty low historically as a percentage of GDP. According to your baseline, uh, CBO's baseline says over the next 30 years, we'll spend about 2.6% of GDP. The alternate fiscal scenario is 34 So I guess when I take a look at this, understanding the, the, the problems in the world, okay, the, the threats to our national security, I look at that and I go, that's probably not realistic that we're going to be able to get away with uh, spending only 2.6 or only 3.4 when historically we spend about 4.2%. I mean, would, would you disagree with that? And And the bigger number was something close to, uh, to long-term averages. But, but you're exactly right that one of the uncertainties that, that that are there in our forecast is something like a, a major war, uh, another recession, something like that, that would make the, uh, uh, the picture of the de deficit look much worse. We had even 4.2, you take a look at the last 50 years, where we had, def you know, during the Korean War, I think we were up 10%. Uh, during the 70s, 80s, I think we were 8 and 7%. We're at historically low percentages of GDP spending already on defense. Let's go on to the, all other spending in the federal government. Over the last 30 years, it's been about 6.2% of GDP. Your baseline says it'll drop down to 4.6%. Your alternate fiscal scenario is 5.9%. Okay, and then interest, again, it's the plug figure, and it depends on, you know, what we think interest rates will be, and nobody really knows that. But I guess the point I'm trying to make, if you're really looking at how realistic is, are these projections, baseline versus alternate fiscal scenario, it kind of gives you a range of the projections. I mean, I would look at this, and one of the reasons I use alternate fiscal scenario, I'd say of, of the more likely scenario, Based on 30 years prior history, I would just kind of look at alternate fiscal scenario. You could maybe make an argument that that might still be low as projected deficits. Would you comment on that? Well, you know, we, we, we didn't want to, we wanted to be careful about pre predicting what Congress was going to do. I understand. Um, so the, the regular baseline is under current law, but, but your, our alternate fiscal scenario is trying to look at the way that, that Congress has behaved in the past. Uh, and, and so we did make an effort to do that. Oh, well, I know that, and Congress is very difficult to predict, yes. other than we'll, we'll, we'll continue right. to be somewhat dysfunctional. But let me go to, with my remaining seconds here, let me go to the last point. Uh, no, let's first of all leave on, I want to talk about revenues, because the last 30 years on average, we've generated about 17.2% of GDP in terms of revenue to the federal government. Now, if you go back 50 years, it's probably been more around 18.1%. So your baseline shows about 19%, average over 30 years. Alternate fiscal scenario is really pretty much about that 50-year average. Now, now let's go to the, the last chart here. This is a chart that shows what percentage of GDP we've, we've raised in revenue comparable to the top marginal tax rate. You know, how, how much are we going to try and punish success, and how effective are we at punishing success and, and dramatically increasing the percentage of revenue we raise as a percent of GDP? You can see, going back to uh, the late 50s, when we had a top marginal tax rate of 91 percent. Now, I think that would uh, give pleasure to a fair amount of people that would like to do that. You know, let's stick it to the rich guys. Um, 
we still only had about 18.1 percent average. Look at, look at how steady that is, regardless of the top marginal tax rate of 91 percent or 70 percent or 50 percent or 28 percent or 39.6 percent. So I guess I want you to comment on our ability as a federal government to try and punish success and do it successfully so that we actually increase revenue to the federal government. Because to me, it's, right. it's somewhat of a fool's errand. And, and when you, you start dramatically increasing marginal tax rates, I would say you dramatically increase the disincentives for people to take the kind of risk taking that actually helps grow our economy. All right. Well, I don't want to comment too much about, the, about specific tax policy things. But, but you're absolutely right that, that tax revenue has been fairly much around 18, 19 percent. There's only been a brief time where it's as high as 19 percent. Uh, to where we projected under our extended scenario, under current law. So that's one of the things that, that I think is a caution, is, is under our, just our regular extended scenario, uh, tax revenues get to a historically high level, and we still have a really significant problem 25 years down the line. But doesn't this chart basically show that yeah, we can attempt to increase revenue as a percentage of GDP by increasing marginal tax rates, but people change their behavior? I mean, this kind of gets back to the static versus dynamic scoring debate right. that I think this is a pretty darn good argument that if we're going to change tax policy, we really do need to understand the dynamic effect of those tax policies on people's behavior and in some way, shape or form, and I, trust me, there's a real complexity here in terms of deductions and you know, you know, what type of income, which I think is kind of silly too, you have different rates on different types of incomes. I, you know, income's income from my standpoint. We should dramatically simplify our tax code. And I think you might have a little more responsiveness if it weren't so complex. But anyway, it's just very difficult to really uh, take more than 18% away from the American public. Isn't that kind of, doesn't that what this, isn't that what that chart pretty well shows? We, uh, historically, yeah, it just, it just hasn't been done. And, and let me just say, too, in part of our forecast, uh, we do have a dynamic component in our, in our economic forecast that underlies this, and we do have some dynamic effect of, of the tax rate being to an historically high level. So that actually does uh, impact economic growth. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, our... Thanks, Senator McCasco. I, I do want to address a little bit in terms of stimulus. You know, what you spend money on, mm -hmm is pretty important, correct? I mean, if, if you, yes. there's no doubt that you spend a lot of money that's going to stimulate the economy, but if you spend it on consumption versus, let's say, infrastructure, right. do, do you know uh, out of the 800 whatever billion dollar stimulus, how much of that was actually spent on what something we would consider infrastructure, highways, bridges, that type of thing, versus just getting, you know, pumped into, uh, for example, city and, and state governments? Yeah, I, I don't know that. It's, it's pretty small, though, isn't it? I, I, I don't know. The I best estimate I've been able to get out of staff is about $50 billion into what I'd consider infrastructure. Right. I, I, want, I want to go back to debt burden and, and what you can really, how much you can really carry, because you are right, it depend, totally depends on the circumstance. You know, in a growing organization, you can take on a lot more debt because you're going to be a lot bigger in, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. Isn't really come down to debt service, though? You know, in terms of whether you can afford it? And isn't that what we're facing right here is because we're at such historically low interest rates? Uh, we're, not, we're not really feeling the, the full economic brunt of this enormous increase into our debt. We're, we're keeping those interest rates artificially low, and we're able to service for the time being, but at some point in time, that's going to stop, correct? That's right, and that's, that's in our 25-year forecast. We do have interest rates moving back to, uh, to more historical levels. To what level? Um, I think we have the Treasury 10-year at something like 2.3%. I, I, I'd have to look that up to make sure. Okay. I, I, think, I think right now, as Senator Enzi was saying, I think we're total borrowing costs is about under 2 percent. Historically, what we're looking at is about 5.3 percent, you know, overall average interest rate that the federal government is paying on its debt. Right. So I, I, think, I think your estimate is about 4.7 percent, so still under that, that 50, 60 year average. Oh, right, yeah, the 4.7 percent is the, uh, the um, net interest. Right. That's four point seven percent of GDP. Basically right. nominal. That, that, inclu that includes inflation, that type of thing. Correct. Right. That's right. Okay. Um, one thing you don't include in your forecast is another recession. Correct. That's right. Uh, I'm just. I just had staff quick give me a, a note on how how frequently we have recessions. And dating back to the '60s is about a nine-year, then three-year, five-year, ten-year, ten-year, eight-year interval. As an economist, that's about right. You know. 
every 10 years or less, we're having another recession, correct? That's right. So again, your, your long-term projections, again, I understand you can't project out a, a, a recession, but we can, based on the past, you can pretty well assume that there will be recessions, maybe three or four or more of those over the next 30 years. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's probably- And that will make the numbers, the $103 trillion, even worse. Well, that's right. We, well, we try, to, we try to work in the long run uh, averages through recessions. So you get some idea of a recession and then recovery, what it averages through that. But there certainly is risk if there, if there is recession. And as Senator Enzi was, was alluding to as well, you know, part of the problem we have in terms of getting this under control is so much of the federal budget is on automatic pilot. that we've only, We really only appropriate about a trillion dollars out of a, you know, what's approaching a $4 trillion budget. Isn't that correct? Yes. And so we don't have a whole lot of room to maneuver on an annual basis in terms of adjusting those things because the, these are programs that are termed entitlement programs. If you qualify it, it gets automatically spent. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between total debt and debt held by the public. Okay. What, what is excluded from debt held by the public versus total debt, which right now is over $18 trillion total debt? Right. right. The idea here is that, that debt that's held by other parts of government is not included in debt held by the public. And the reason that at least we focus on debt held by the public is this is the stuff that has economic impact. One part of the government owing money to another part of the government doesn't really impact the economy. It's, like it's owing not to external debt, but it is a debt of the, you know, for example, one of the biggest element of that is really Social Security Trust Fund, correct? Yes. And that's about $2.77 trillion worth, correct? I think that's right, yes. Now, to the trust fund, that, that trust fund holds about $2.77 trillion of U.S. government bonds, correct? I think so. So again, that's an asset to the trust fund, right? But what is a U.S. government bond, what's it called to the Treasury? A liability, correct? Right. Now, coming from the business world, you, if you're talking about one overall organization like the federal government, you'd consolidate the books. So when you consolidate the books of the federal government, you look at a $2.77 trillion asset in the trust fund versus a $2.77 trillion liability treasury, what does that net out to? Can you, can you say it? Uh, can you run it by me once more? Okay, a, a $2.77 trillion asset in the, in the trust fund of U.S. government bonds is a $2.77 trillion liability treasury. Oh, zero's out, yes. It, it, it nets to? Zero. Zero. So the trust fund, the Social Security trust fund, in terms of a financial value of the federal government is equal to zero, correct? Right, yes. It's just an accounting convention. It's a bookkeeping. Right. It's a, okay, so I want to just go through what happens now that we are actually paying out more in benefits than we're taking the payroll tax. What, what's currently happening is the interest on those bonds are still being paid into the trust fund, and the interest is covering the deficits currently. But in a few years, the interest payments will no longer cover the, the expanding deficit in Social Security. So the Social Security Trust Fund is going to have to start cashing those bonds into the Treasury, correct? Yes. So they'll, they'll take a bond, maybe $100 billion, if that's the shortfall, give it to the Treasury. The Treasury will write, you know, give them $100 billion to pay out benefits. But what does the Treasury do? How, how does the Treasury get that $100 billion? They borrow it from somebody else. They borrow it. So, so I guess from my standpoint, the debt held within these agencies is an obligation. Now, I realize we don't recognize it as such because I think by federal law, we really don't have to. We're really not obligated to make Social Security payments. It's, it's really, Social Security is really not a pre-funded retirement fund. We didn't really take those funds in and put those into account for an individual taxpayer, correct? We brought, we brought that money in, we spent it, and in its place, we issued a U.S. government bond. We, we, in a previous hearing, we actually had the trust fund. We've got a picture of it. Didn't bring it today. It's a four-drawer file in Parkersburg, West Virginia. That, that's, that's what politicians from both parties are telling the American people, looking them straight in the eye and lying to them, saying that that's going to fund Social Security deficits for the next 20 or so years. It, it, it doesn't do that, does it? Uh, no. No. So the trust fund is a fiction. By and large, the trust fund is a fiction. It has no financial value to the federal government. Now had we, just real quick, had the federal government actually taken those surpluses and invested those in assets outside the federal government, 
know, for example, maybe a Dow Jones stock index fund. Those would be a real hard asset that then the trust fund could actually cash those in and a different entity could have paid that in. That actually would be funding benefits. But that's not what happened, right? Right. We took the money in, we spent it, it's gone. And all we have in place of it is a piece of paper that basically says $2.77 trillion. Okay, we will be exploring this in far greater detail in, in, a, in a future hearing. By the way, uh, to both you and Senator McCaskill, if, you, if you're looking for an ally, uh, you know, there's, there's a concept out there, the cure strategy, which I think is exactly the direction we should be going in. I mean, as a fiscal conservative, I think it's money really well spent to try and cure diseases. And what, what I'd love to do is get a commitment of CBO to really take a look at some of the projections, for example, how much we're going to be spending on Alzheimer's if we don't come up with a cure. You know, what, what is the current cost of just diabetes? Uh, th those types of things. I think it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, in you know, my guess, it would be very difficult to uh, project you know, prevention, you know, and say if you, if you do this, but we certainly can have a pretty good hard number on what we're spending treating diabetes, what we're spending treating Alzheimer's, and then do the demographic projection in terms of how many, you know, with the aging population, what that's going to cost. I know the Alzheimer's Association has done those types of things, so I think those are extremely good. Uh, numbers and the types of information you would need to help direct action, which kind of gets us back to the, the, the point we were making this committee. It's, it's really about how do, we, how do we simplify how we project, how we communicate those projections. Um, it's about providing information, not, not relying on demagoguery anymore, because the only way we're going to solve these problems is, again, lay out the information, lay out the facts, have a, a very unbiased, nonpartisan uh, intermediary. Uh, arbitrator of, of the information so that we, you know, we're not sitting battling over, well, this is my figure, that's your figure, but we can kind of come together and go, okay, let's at least first agree on the figures as best we can, understand what, what underlies them. Uh, so again, I, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we, we've, we've produced a lot of, we've reported a lot of pieces of legislation. We have come to CBO in the past looking for scores. I know you're busy. Uh, I'm hoping you're valuing this, and I hope you understand the direction I'm trying to go here. Let's simplify things. Let's get information to the American public. Let's get information to policymakers so that we're on the same page. So I, I certainly am looking for a commitment out of CBO to, with what limited resources you have and on a prioritized basis. And we're, you know, we're not going to overburden you. I'm very sympathetic for that standpoint, but really would like a little bit more help in terms of getting scores on some of these things and, and work with you to, again, prioritize what our requests are. Is that fair enough? Uh, sure. Um, yes. Just two quick final questions. I want to go back a little bit on, on debt and serviceability of it. Uh, do you have any sense, and we'll, if you don't, let me know and we'll submit as a question to the record, what our current maturity level is of our current federal debt versus prior years and what the recommendation be going forward of, of trying to extend that, take advantage of these low interest rates? Can you comment on that? I can't, but I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Okay, I, I think that's pretty important. I'd, I'd like to see where we used to be, where we are today, because my sense is we've really shortened that maturity time period pretty dramatically to take advantage of these very low short-term interest rates when what we maybe ought to be doing is really trying to go as long as possible without driving up the interest rates themselves by, by having a great, great deal of demand. The other thing, again, this, this might be picked up in our follow-on hearing on Social Security, but do you know what current law is when we no longer have those bonds, when that, that accounting convention runs out with Social Security benefits. Do, do you know what, what actually happens cur according to current law if we don't do something? Because um, we're, we're facing that right. with Social Security sure. Disability Trust Fund in, in the next year or two, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, the, um, that's right. The disability one is, is pretty quick. It's uh, FY 2017. Um, no, I don't know what the current law is on that. I, I, think, I think we've sort of assumed that money is put in there. Some, um, something's going to happen. You know, I, I've heard, and again, I, it's very difficult for us. I've heard that basically what ends up happening by current law is benefits would be reduced to equal the revenue generation. But I, I can't get a real handle on that, so I can't say that definitively at all. But you know, if, if you could check on that, we're going to certainly bring in some experts in Social Security to find out what is the law if we just put our heads in the sand on this, which is something I, I don't recommend we do. But again, D Director Hall and Dr. Hall, I really do appreciate your, your testimony, the time you've taken today. And, and I really, in all sincerity, I want to work with you because you your, your agency is so critically important to get that information out there.
for the American public to understand the depth of these issues because, as Senator Enzi was saying, the sooner you address these pro problems, the, the less painful the solutions will be. Uh, so with that in mind, got to get my hearing script. Uh, this hearing record will remain open for 15 days until July 24th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.